Good evening, everybody. This is William Madero from Newbie Productions, and I hope all you guys are staying safe out there through all this. Um, Protect Servant Care was a movie that Newbie and myself shot and directed a few years ago, addressing the disconnection between police officers and minorities in the community. And unfortunately, it's still relevant today, now more than ever, especially with the recent events that have taken place across the nation. So we hope you guys can watch this film, take something away from it. And we just want to get the ball rolling on a conversation. And huge shout out to Mike Zotos with Performer and El Mundo Boston for realizing there was a need to show this film and, and making it available to you guys. So enjoy the film. When a cop screams freeze, all we hear is black boy die. Tell me, when's the last time you ever seen a black boy fly? Bullets clip wings, heat makes the black boy fry. Till we scatter like chickens, dipping in the black oven skies from SWAT. With red eyes, with glocks, and K9's apartments, high rises, pots, and eight pies of rocks. Marijuana, black cotton, slave ties to pop. On goes Oscar, that's Trayvon. There's a pistol dripping, ain't no one in prison but our kind. Barely indictments, except for our cars, I guess the black of the berry. Sweeter the juice, the blacker the gun, the bigger they shoot, the blacker the skin, the bigger the bruise. They blackballing Colin for calling the truth. They gon' praise him, okay, but call him a fluke. When you kneel, they run the clock, but this time it's on you. What year is it? They won't boycott a ball game, but they boycotting you. They're fearing it. Just shut up and play the game, boy. Until the game they play is you. When nooses are on your neck, they're playing the puppet tan. Your pedal was going corporate. Smell the greed in the air. See the fear in your eyes. Keep your hand on 10 and 2. And if you move, you will die. Just ask Fernando. Or better yet, ask his daughter. Or maybe ask Eric Garner's. We move from implicit bias to collateral damage And these kids are martyrs for wars they never started Now I live in the fear of becoming daily departed And we're the bad guys for asking you to stop it, how ironic We're not asking you to stop doing your job Because we need you, of course But we are begging you, please Stop using deadly force see these towns and when you see these thugs being thrown into the back of a paddy wagon, please don't be too nice. Today we send a message up to the people who have been at the top that we have had enough. 2012. I'm fighting for justice. My son, Kevin L. Cooper, was killed by a Baltimore City police officer. My name is Wanda Johnson. I'm the mother of Oscar Grant. 41 shots fired at my child. We need people that know how to handle power. The greatest privilege of many white Americans is to encounter a police person and not die in the encounter and to live to tell about it. I went to school, paddy wagon in the back, police escort up front. I went to school doing busing. The police was there to protect me, but when we got into the school, their assignment changed. They was there to arrest me. The uniform is there to intimidate. The hat is there to intimidate. The uniform is there to eject authority. We need to take down the systems of oppression that keep many of our black and brown people down. Do you think of safety or do you think of fear? Easily fear. Fear uh, when I when I see a police officer rolling up on me uh, to pull me over. I would say another thing I would say about police officers initially, my initial reaction are assholes. Like he was superior to me just because he had the badge. It, it weighs on us. It, it does. You talk to police officers out there, and they'll tell you it weighs. We we don't like being the bad guy. When they go put on the cuffs, they force it, and the people might want to hit them back, and they would just cause like a lot of problems because they're gonna fight and stuff, and then they're gonna get shot. Whole city, our city. Whole city, our city. 
the relationship between police and black men is uh, the same as, as, as it's always been, uh, which is uh, terrible. He whips open my car door. Roundhouse kicked my friend. Providence, oh, I've been chased by horses in Providence. That I had just disrespected him so bad. Handcuffed him and they put us both in the police car. I tried to actually try to break up a fight, then this lady on a horse, like, galloping and chased me down. I remember once a police officer walked into the classroom and the um, kids were like, uh-oh, he's gonna kill me. You don't know which one's which. You don't know who's good cop, bad cop. Who's racist, who's not. Now you, now you see a police officer standing around and you might have a parent say, you see that man, you want him to take you away, you better stop behaving yourself. You see it? And they're already initiating that fear of what a police officer is. And that, that, needs, okay. that needs to stop. What if they didn't see any change from the civil rights, human rights movement in the 50s till now, that people of color were still dying at the hands of the criminal justice system and police departments. That's why a lot of people fear. I, I don't know how many cases we see a year where there are white folk just walking around with guns and officers do not treat them as a threat, but the minute they see a black person with a gun, it is a terrible situation, they feel threatened. In fact, they don't even need to see a black person with a gun, they just need to look or fit the profile. You need to be careful. You need to be careful when you pull out your wallet. You need to be careful speaking to officers. You don't go to your back pockets or anything. And I think that has to do with the community because... I think they are fearful of black people. I really just believe this. Many times it's fear. They have heard the stories. They believe the story on the news about how something's gone perhaps horribly wrong. The line is drawn, you know. They're wrong, we're right. We got screwed, they got away with it. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a real problem. So how much do you think your perception of I'd rather be anywhere except with cops or elected officials is formulated by the media? <laughs> At some point, there has to be a generation of young people that says, you know what? I'm tired of the police coming down and being able to do whatever they want. The only reason they get to do whatever they want is because illegal activity is happening in prevalence in our community. Our community has to do a better job on the part of men on how to socialize brothers, how to engage the larger world and law enforcement. If you teach a kid how to speak with teachers, if you teach a kid, those are all authority figures and you do that your whole life. So how are you not going to teach them how to deal, how to interact with a police officer? What I'd rather try to do with, from the police department perspective is engage those parents and those students in letting them know, hey, we're here to be officer friendly. I think we really need to do a better job on letting the public know that we're there to help and not to be the enforcer. That for black men, we have to get this additional lesson on how to interact with officers so to avoid our lives being taken. What bothers me sometimes is when white people can't have a real conversation about race. And we have it all the time amongst ourselves. Black people have that conversation, white people have that conversation, but we have to have a real conversation and, and not allow our feelings to be hurt. If I took out this uniform that didn't identify me as a police officer and I went to Staten Island, Ferguson, or South Carolina, would I worry about my life and the value of it. Would my life matter? Where's the where's the disconnect? Why is each side missing missing the other? Because I think that there are valid points on each side, but I think they're being missed. Same story every time. Same story every time. Damn. I was meeting with a, a group of men at a church in Queens years ago, and it was just men and teens in the black church in Queens, and I had my gun belt with me. So I called up a young fellow, he was about 16 or 17 and I strapped my gun belt on him and he morphed right in front of their eyes. I've been told by too many children that they are afraid of the cops, that they are, that they, that they are afraid to walk their own streets. Why? Because even when everything is on camera and we have all the facts, we still get no justice. We understand this country's ugly past and present and probably future
torture if we do not continue to stand up and fight against this racism. So I said to the men, what did you see in him? They said, he's an entirely different person. The gun changed him. I said, so we don't need you as a police officer. You're black, but you're not qualified. Some major situations that have occurred across the country where um, men have lost their men have lost their men have lost their lives um, as a result of being of being shot by officers. Don't pull it out. Don't pull it out. He just shot his arm off. We got pulled oh. over on Larpener. I told him not to reach for it. I told him to get his hand out. He had, you told him to get his ID, sir, and his driver's license. Oh my God, please don't tell me he's dead. So one of the, in one of my talks with my father at a young age, I was taught that police on the street are the judge, jury, and executioner. Education is huge. And I've been saying that from jump, that, you know, we need to educate people out there. We need to let people know what we do. You know, what, what our job's about. You know, the, the, the decisions we have to make in less than a second, half the time, or we're dead. I've had many opportunities where I could have shot somebody, killed them, justifiably shot them, had no problem with a grand jury or any hearings, never discharged them around. There's nothing in my contract that says I need to take a bullet before I can react to something. Sure. You see what I'm saying? If you pull a gun on me, whether it's fake or not, I'm going to do what I have to do to be able to go back to my family. Shame on you for doing that to me. Cops were dying every month. We had two guys die back to back days. Everybody in New York had a gun. We are here today because we believe that our country can do better. <laughs> I mean, I care about where I come from, and, and I care about the community where I come from, so I want to leave a legacy for my kids, and I want to I wanna leave a legacy for when I'm gone, or somehow, whatever happens to me, so someone could say, yo, Ruckus did that. Providence, they have their issues with their police department. Um, it's just a lack of respect. You want to be cool with the with the cop and you want the cop to be cool back you want you want to make sure everything is on the up and up but in your head you know that they're already thinking black men are threats and dangerous there will always be tension between uh, those two groups of folks but yet something bad happens to them and who are they call me I was a DJ in a club called Finnegan's, which is right downtown Providence, and I usually go outside with my cousin, and we go outside and just diffuse the crowd. Hey! Is it popping? Hey, it's popping, baby. It's popping. They're gonna be like, oh, get to your car. What are you doing? So uh, I'm helping some kids get to the car. I'm walking them to their car, and then uh, a cop comes, like, I'm walking back to Finnegan's. A cop comes from behind me, and he goes, Yo, what are you doing out here? Get the fuck in the, get the fuck back in the club. You cannot prove your manhood on the street corner with a police officer. This whole thing is about psychology. Why do I have, why are you like talking to me like, and then he's like, I either get to your fucking car or get in the fucking club. If the guy is cursing at you, if he's calling you a nigga or anything else, you absorb that. Some, uh, wh however your tone is, I'm not gonna let you speak to me like that. You don't get an attitude, sucking your teeth, flaring up and all of that because that takes things to another level. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take your badge number and I'm gonna report you in the morning. Our young men need to know an encounter with a police officer is a psychological and a physical engagement. You want to be on top of the psychological game because if you're in control of your mind, that he'll never be in control of your body. Kevin was a student. He was 14 years old. He was very vibrant. He loved football. He had a dream. He had aspirations. He was an uncle. He was a friend. He was a brother. And he wanted to become a football player. I'm a 
he was a very shy young man, very smart, and he loved food, he loved to laugh, he loved soccer, and he loved basketball. What really uh, made him to dream about America was his love about Michael Jordan. Anytime you were down um, or sad about something, Oscar would be right there to say something funny or let you know that it's going to be all right and encourage you to become joyful again. The police are trying to communicate that, you know, their jobs are not their jobs are not safe. They have to make they have to make, you know, decisions in a short period of time. And the community is saying America is not concerned about violence until it's the Negro who's violent. The same nigga that they might see selling drugs or they might see walking walking to be to Brown University to go to class to be a doctor. You're just a nigga to them. There seems, there seems to be um, a narrative that we have in, in the country and in a lot of communities that there's a war against African-American men that's being waged by the police department right now. And I'm curious as to uh, what, you got, what you guys take on it. Do you think it's true? And uh, to some degree, based upon the things that we've seen happen, do you think it's deserved? I'm thinking about it, I'm just like, you know what, I'm gonna grab his badge number. So I'm like, what's your badge number? I look, I see his badge number and I'm like, I'm gonna take that and, and I'm gonna talk to your superior in the morning. And then as I say that, his his other co-officer, or whatever you wanna call him, he comes up and he's like, what are you taking his badge number for? I said, well, now I'm gonna take your badge number. How many times have, have, has somebody, I know when I was a kid, I was always told that the police were there to help you. I lost my oldest son at the tender age of 16, along with my cousin's son and my sister's oldest son in a car accident, a horrific accident. He missed his brother and he began to have emotional issues. When he got to the Bronx, he settled there. And as you know, any immigrant, when you come here, you have to start anew. So what he did was to start selling on the street to save his money for college. That day he told me he was going to go watch the fireworks with his friends and his daughter was saying, no daddy, no daddy, don't go. Take me to Chuck E. Cheese. She wanted to go to Chuck E. Cheese and he told her, he promised her that he would take her the next day. And so he gave her a dollar to not cry. And so um, I told him to take Bart and he was like, no, we're just going to drive. I said, no, you're just going to take Bart. And so he took Bart. There's a couple of cars parked on this street uh, because the street was blocked off. One of the cars that was parked on the street was a meter made car. Uh, what they give, give parking tickets. So as I'm walking back, I got my back turned to the two officers. They run up behind me, grab my arms from the back and throw me on top of the meter made car. Now I know this is a different situation now. That particular morning on August the 12th of 2006, I called the police at a little after nine in the morning because Kevin was having an emotional breakdown. Amadou came home, so he said, oh, I'm so tired, but I'm hungry too. I want to get up for something to eat. On his way back, when he went, he went with his one of his neighbor. They both knew each other from the same place. So on the way back, they talk and Amadou had a Coca-Cola and a sandwich. So that man went to his house, Amadou continued to go in his. And so he took Bart and on the way home, um, they said some kind of altercation had occurred um, and a policeman came on the platform and he was calling, you know, he was uh, yelling and cussing with his taser out, telling um, African-American young men, not knowing who, but just telling them to get out of the train and get, up, get against the wall. As I'm on the ground, they mace me. I'm already handcuffed, I'm already on the ground, I'm not fighting, I already know what it is if I fight, who knows if I'm gonna be alive tomorrow. Um, and I'm just thinking about my kids at the same time, like if I fight, if I fight this situation, am I gonna, am I gonna be talking to my kids tomorrow or are they gonna be reading about me tomorrow? Some of the officers came and counted him in the yard. 
Kevin was talking, you know, and um, they said the call was abated. Everything was fine. He was calm. The, the one officer left. Kevin got up. He, they had him sitting out in the yard. He got up and he walked into the basement and we were down in the basement and he walked past and he was mumbling and the officer turned and said who are you speaking to he says i'm not talking to you four police officers civilian clothes were driving on mark police on mark car and they're driving passing by and they saw amadou what happened that night there was five witnesses amadou and the four officers. The other officer ran over and uh, threw Oscar onto the ground on his stomach and pinned him and threw Oscar and then moved him over and put him on Oscar's friend Carlos' leg. Oscar was about 165 pounds. The first officer who had him, his knee in his back and neck area was probably 300 pounds, probably six, about 6'2 six or 6'3, um, where Oscar wasn't able, was pinned down and wasn't able to breathe. Oscar was in an uncomfortable position, moving, trying to get off Carlos's leg, and the officer stood up <laughs> in the back, point blank, and Oscar you know, looked up and said, you shot me, man, I have a four-year-old daughter. Kevin proceeded to go upstairs. The officer continued to follow him from the basement to the first floor to the second level. And he's taunting him, you know, you think you're tough, you're not tough, and they're back and forth, and he's back and forth. And I'm still saying, why are you in my home? Why are you having this conversation with my 14-year-old son? So I'm continuously asking the officer to please leave our home. He proceeded downstairs, Kevin went downstairs, and went into the kitchen. <laughs> so Amadou was cut down. Matter of fact, one of the bullets went right through the sole of his shoe. He was laying on the ground when he was shot. The bullet went through his foot. He didn't fit the description of a rapist. Two of them went to the fire department. A friend of mine was an instructor at the fire academy. He said, I'm not teaching these guys anything. He said, these are murderers. One of them, in fact, has killed before in the group. And Amadou have no criminal record, not even a speeding ticket. When he went into the kitchen, I had called uh, my pastor. And um, I said to my pastor that the officer was in our home and he was having this argument with Kevin. Kevin picked up a plastic dustpan. And when he picked up the plastic dustpan, that's when the officer maced him and he shot him. Man's heart has waxed cold. Man's heart have to see people as people, have to see them as human and not dehumanized. I can't, as I can't breathe, I'm like, yo, I need this, I need the door open. Like, I'm, I'm yelling in the car, I need the door open, I need the door open. The cop comes over, you want the door open? He's like, you, sh you should have fucking thought about that when you were trying to get my badge number and slam the door back on me. Me being able to voice it to as many people as I can, I feel like I'm talking for Mike Brown. I'm talking for all these guys that are not here with us anymore. I feel like I'm giving that, that little piece of justice. I'm not advocating violence, but there is a limit to what people will endure. There is no hierarchy of hurts. Whether they were 8, 18, or 28, they were somebody's child. Every life is a value. People do have a question whether, if you're a person of color, if your lives matter or not. If seemingly there is no change from the civil rights movement, human rights movement, when people of color were dying at the hands of the criminal justice system, to the point now where people are dying at the hands of the criminal justice system. Notice I didn't say unfairly, unjustly. 
that's to be proven in a case-by-case -case basis but perception is reality I think that you know when we talk about team justice that we have to figure out what is the appropriate what is the appropriate charge for this person but that takes time that takes investigation but when the community is on fire I don't have time for investigate investigate something has to be something has to be done so I think there's give and take there's give and take on both ends Seeing people being murdered on TV, live on TV, yes, condemn the guilty, they're guilty, but also don't stand with the guilty party. You're just as guilty if you do not step up and you do not condemn that behavior. And I'm not gonna act like I'm naive that the blue wall doesn't exist in people's mind. With these high profile cases that happen, it's there are barely any indictments. Mm. And that's what pisses my generation off. Now the older African Americans or people of color don't feel that same sense that younger people do. For many years, black folks have been crying out for justice, crying out against bias policing. See, in a number of cases, man, young brothers have died as a result of suicide by cop. They just rolled the wrong way up on dudes. Well, that's because older people are not pulled over by the cops for various reasons. They're not, you know, asked to uh, stop by officers while walking down the street. They have a generally good relationship. Racial profiling and police brutality. But unfortunately, our cries fall on deaf ears. This is about us. The black community has got to develop its own campaign for defending, disciplining, and training our sons. Respect people's humanity, respecting and giving people their dignity, and not just ready to shoot somebody and just treat them like shit. One thing that comes to mind is that the race is not given to the swift nor to the strong but to the one who endures till the end and so no matter what our plight is we will continue to fight to see that laws are changed we'll continue to fight to see that justice is served and we know that we serve a God who will render justice Amen. if we don't see justice here on earth but if a police officer tells you to stop, stop. When you don't, now it's going a certain another way. You see what I'm saying? Never resist. Follow the instructions given. If you're being stopped, keep your hand, your, your palms are up. Nothing in my hand. You want to search me? Go ahead and search me, officer. The battle is in the courtroom. Pick that battle wisely. Just come home. Murder implies, murder implies intent. You charged them, you charged them with murder. So you basically went before a grand jury of people and told them that these police officers who showed up, you know, they were called, they showed up to a scene, and they showed up with the intent. If you don't give them lesser included charges and the grand jury doesn't suggest it, they're left with an all or nothing situation. You said, mur you said murder. Okay, well if these are the stipulations for murder and you don't prove that and I'm on the grand jury, then I'm gonna no bill him. I'm gonna be like, no bill. If they take out their weapon and shoot an unarmed person, knowing that that bullet will result in a death, then that is murder in the first degree. And that's why in so many of these cases, the, the standard litany will be, I thought I saw a weapon, I thought I saw something, he reached for this and I thought it was a weapon, I then drew my weapon and fired in defense of myself. They called us into a hearing and offered my family $10,000 for Kevin's life, and I told them no. I would not accept $10,000 for my son's life because his, son, his life was valuable. What happens when you sign a civil settlement, that I'm agreeing that I don't want you to prosecute in exchange for you giving me this amount of money. We're gonna pay you off, you keep your mouth shut. I had a meeting with one of the top judges in Rhode Island for they were gonna pay me out. And, and the payment was $20,000, and I refused it. Now, how does that hurt black people? Because the next victim, who may need to refer to case law, can't 
refer to case law because you took a settlement on your case. There was no finding of fact. Please don't tell me this, Lord. Please, Jesus, don't tell me that he's gone. Please don't tell me that he's gone. Please, officer, don't tell me that you just did this to him. You shot four bullets into him, sir. I'm not saying like this is just, this is the right thing that he did, but we're giving him the space to do it because this is what we are doing to our own people. Like, we're killing our own people. They don't have to do anything to us. Over what? Stupid. <laughs> In that second word. When we talk about, you know, the perception versus the reality, the perception out there, the police are out there just manhandling people when the numbers show. It's like 0.01%. So you're talking about a very small percentage getting a very large amount of publicity. So if there's no crime while I'm working that post in uniform and the uniform officer's job is to deter crime. If there's no crime, I've done my job. So then you got police officers that are doing it right every single day, having to deal with the repercussions of that. What's a bigger problem for the African-American community? Police violence against black men or black on black crime. You get a different answer depending on who you ask. You get a different answer depending on who you ask. Absolutely. You know, and both are, and both are a problem, but then you say, well, what's the bigger, what's the bigger problem that's being faced? You can learn from everybody in the community, even the negative. That's right. But you should always learn the backstory, boys. That's right. Oh. Not, and not, no one that I ever knew of was born bad. That's like, right. you're birthed and like, oh, yes, that's a bad kid. A lot of black on black crime is displaced and misplaced rage. So if you say you live in a situation where the, where the deck is stacked against you, where you got people against you and you didn't grow up with shit, rage and anger that we feel towards a system that doesn't value us, a system that oppresses us. Why aren't you putting yourself in the best position to succeed? That's the question you gotta ask yourself. But a system that represents this sense of power that we can't defeat. At the end of the day, we accept this. But it doesn't negate the amount of rage and anger that we have inside. So what do you do with that, right? Psychology 101, classic case of displacement. And to give up that mentality and you don't know what's gonna be on the other side, is scary. People are scared to get right. That you get off your asses, sorry Rev, is what it is. And that you do move forward and help while others are Monday morning quarterbacking. We do not accept this. We do not accept this. Hurt people hurt people. But what we believe is that heal people heal people. We have to stop blaming all of the ills in the community on the police department. Every ill that happens in our neighborhood isn't, hap isn't happening because, you know, white officers are, are shooting African-American men. There are certain things that are going on that the police didn't start, cause, or are or, or perpetuating, mm -hmm. I should say. The kids are our future, but this future of kids, they're not playing no games, man. They're not playing no games. So y'all better pay attention. We should not have to always call the police to solve every problem that's happening in our community. I mean, we get hit. Even when basement floods, people blame us. Like, what are you doing? Now my basement's flooded. There's a bat in my house. What are you going to do about it? We don't always want to call the police every time there's something negative happening in our community. Some communities can actually police themselves. Stop thinking we're going to rely on the law and take, take it into our own hands. But if we could, we would. Get off that protest line and put an application in. How many think that police are bad for the community? As bad as it sounds, the only way you can make a change is to get in there and make that change. Does anyone in here want to be a police officer when they graduate, when they grow up? At least 6,000 to 20,000 people sign up. This year, 1,500. On any given day, you get on a side road, 
be subject to the acrimony and the hate of a police force that could snipe you or wipe you out. I am never going to encourage anyone who looks like me to become an agent in a force that historically abuses, demeans, and attacks the same people who they look like. You should hire more black people, but then when people of color, Latino, Cabo Verde, Somalian, don't get on their cases when they want to join. Like, how can you do that? Are you sure you want to do that? And there are many officers that I've talked to that have experience that have experienced that. I didn't, I, you know, I'm not the type of person that, you know, arrests unwarranted. I'm not Superman. I'm not a cow, I'm not a cowboy. I'm here and I want to work. But even when I have that mentality, I still get treated like I'm that sellout, an Uncle Tom, or a traitor. Of course that was said to me. I think the question is not about whether or not we need more officers of color. We have to start changing the conversation to how does a community police itself. I said it's a calling. It's not a job. Whoa, who taught you that? <laughs> he looked me in the eyes and he shook my hand like a man. Yeah. Way to go. <laughs>
uh, a victim, I had been traumatized, which at that time I was never offered any kind of medical treatment. No one asked me, did I need, was I okay? That needs to be addressed because it leads to post-traumatic stress, which isn't just applicable to our soldiers. We've been seeing war in the communities for years. 58 homicides occurred in, the, in Boston by the end of 2017. Majority of those homicides were black and Latinx youth, unfortunately. We hope that moving forward, you are able to decrease those numbers, increase public safety for the youth, and build rapport between our communities and the Boston Police Department. We are counting on you. Not just in words, but in action. That when we see each other, we see ourselves. And don't get so caught up in politics. Don't get caught up in trying to be important that we have to look at each other and understand that when we see each other, we see ourselves. When we know that, when we live that, when we believe that, we're better. Yes, That's when we're at our best. And until then, we'll still struggle. But we needed to create an example here today with this brother to let him know that we got him. Not because he's gonna be perfect, but because we want to make sure that when he sees us, he sees an ally, he sees a friend, and he sees a partner. And it's so that he'll realize that he's covered. Yeah. Yes. That we've got his back. Yes. Yeah. Oh God. We... But when I speak about that day, it's hard not to cry. It's hard not to feel the cracks in your heart that's been broken. The minute you put a color with something, mm -hmm. you're automatically going to turn off a segment of the population. And we know all lives matter. So whoever picked that title, I give them an F in English. Here's another movement that had a, a ha it didn't have a hashtag, National Association for Advancement of Colored People. And they put that out there, National Association for Advancement of Colored People, because there was a matter of colored people being lynched colored people being disadvantagedly dismembered and taken apart, families being destroyed. National Association for Advancement of Colored People mm -hmm. had to be put out there to have the conversation. Until we get to a point where all lives matter, people should be able to advocate for justice and equality. So they have to exist. I wish they didn't need to exist, but they have to exist. All they can say is, you're in our prayers. Can't do nothing about it. We're sorry for your loss. Never, never, never took a look at a minority or someone different than us and said, we're not going to help them, but we're going to try to screw them. We're going to prosecute them. I never, do I say it goes on? Yeah, I'm sure it does. But I just have to tell you person to person, I, I never encountered that. we awaken to a gentle battle and we must decide if we will go in the direction of worry of weariness and indifference or if we will go in the direction of joy of peace of equality and justice of all the negotiations and decisions of our day this gentle battle each morning is the most important as soldiers how shall we march We've witnessed so much and it's just hard for me. I mean, we can talk about it, but that's where I have like a standpoint because I'm just like, we're just talking. You have to see the change. Yeah, we just, yeah, we have to see something. Body cameras seem like the next step. We did not want to rely on a random citizen being around with their cell phone who had enough storage space on their iPhone to record what was going on. You know, being cross-examined by a defense attorney, you know, as, as I'm going back and forth, Afterwards, my first thought was if I had a tool that would always be recording what's going on between an officer and a civilian so that we would have that evidence if something negative ever happened. We didn't want it being said that once we had this pilot program going that we didn't get any input from our community, in our homes, on our streets. And so we moved to policy that we have public meetings inviting people to add to the policy. I see the value in it for, for false accusations being made. So now you got two completely different points of views. I see the value in it for when officers make mistakes. How about the fact that there is a gray area in the middle? The plastic dust pan was as the 
police say was a weapon. You gotta look at it from their point of view. What actions, how did they interpret actions? And we came up with a program where 100 officers were but the command staff worked first. I wore the camera first. I wouldn't ask the officers to do something that I wasn't willing to do myself. Also, another thing uh, we're trying to push in the political realm is to have the police officers tested, drug tested. If you're working on any regular job, if you have an accident, and if you have any type of shooting, which is a major incident, you should be drug tested. It's not because they don't have complaints against officers, but because they don't trust the system of complaining against officers. So what we have currently is early intervention. If you're flagged for two or three complaints, your captain is coming in explaining what's going on with the officer. What we did in New York City need to happen nationwide. We as family uh, victims, we rallied and we pushed Governor Cuomo to pass an independent special prosecutor law so that now when there is a shooting case by the police, it's going to be at the desk of the uh, DOJ instead of the DA because DA and police work together. Nobody knows your child better than you know your child yourself. So we have to ring his bell. He doesn't have a voice anymore, but his mother does. Women who have been robbed of their babies because of gun violence, brutality, and we're thankful for those mothers. We uplift your names and we uplift the names of your children. Always when there is a shooting case and it's police officers, the victim is victimized again by assassinating their character. The officer has never tried to come back and uh, make peace with me regarding that situation. He did apologize to me. He was a different man and he was a more humble man when he spoke to me. He was very humble. Just came from the grave, scrapes on her legs from her knees in the pavement, wet concrete from her tears in the eyes, six years past still stuck in the time, every time the news come on we reminded, we neglect the pain while they cherish the violence, trying to make change but we buried in silence, how can we take flight when the devil the pilot, I swear it's hard living life trying to chase all your dreams when it's kings getting killed by police. Thinking that it could have been me. I feel I can't straighten that I got hit by a stray in the playground. Look at this world, I feel like we let MLK down. Never believed in God, well, I suggest you pray now. They killed my brother, so I feel some type of way now. Hands up, they gon' still shoot you face down. 38 caliber pressed to my dome. Bullets, they can never penetrate my soul. I accepted his apology because as being a woman of faith, that's the first thing that Jesus spoke from the cross. He said, forgive them for they know not what they have done. You treat a person as a human being. I've taken murderers and rapists to dinner and sat down in a restaurant, not Mickey D's. We take you to a restaurant when we lock you up because we don't eat junk food. But if you get stupid, if your fork and your knife is not moving right, we'll kill you in the restaurant.
What's up guys, hope you guys enjoyed the documentary. Now it's about step two. What are you going to do next? What are some action steps that you're going to do next? I challenge you guys right now to, you know, challenge your city councilors, challenge your police chief, your police commission, your state reps, the federal de delegation, the congresswoman or congressman, whoever's re representing your district, your governor, even our president. What are you going to do next? Some action steps to make sure this does not happen again. If you guys want to see the film again, uh, just go to our website, newbieproductions.com, N-O-U-B-E productions.com. It's also on 2B TV. It's an app. Just type in Protect, Serve, and Care, or it's also on Amazon Prime. Be safe, guys, and Godspeed.